For Kramer Media's Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today is Chairman of Southern Base International Realty SA, Lou Jiffen, to discuss his book titled Soul Mandate, The Extraordinary Life of a Property Maverick. In the book, you share that your friend had always asked you to write a book as you had many stories to share with them while playing golf. It's been interesting to also know that your mother had a successful estate business. What are your fondest memories of your mother? Well, we had, a, a, I would say, a controversial relationship, my mom and me. There's plenty of credit there, but we were both independent people. Now, if a baby is born and the baby is independent, the mother will not recognize that independence. So we were butt-heading from an early age. So what really happened was the, the marriage between my mother and my father was, uh, was up and down. And uh, he was a good guy, but he was a gambler. He was a victim. He was a compulsive gambler. And even on the uh, honeymoon, he disappeared for three days gambling. So four years after the, the marriage, she decided that no, she can't take it anymore. She's going to improve her life. So she booked herself into the Sorbonne University in Paris. And so she uh, left, which is very traumatic for me. And it's in the book. And um, she arrived back a year later. So in that year, I was left with my grandparents. It was not much better in terms of uh, caregiving because they were also gamblers and they played rummy all day long with their friends. So I was left to the maid at the time to bring me up as a mother. So the maid took me everywhere. She took me upstairs, downstairs, to, to the quarters upstairs. She really and truly looked after me, but I developed a sense of independence when I was four. So. I started making my own rules <laughs> from that particular time because no one else was really interested in, in teaching me. Wow. So my mother did come back a year later and um, I was obviously annoyed because I tried to drop a water bomb on her as she got out of the taxi. It was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and many people don't know that you had a construction business. Can you briefly share how the business started? Yeah, well, it was all, all part of, um, of an evolution. So the construction business, I had as a young man in my 20s. Because although I tried real estate, I didn't like it. I was too young for real estate, you know, you get a 20 year old arrives at the house, but I was good. I still sell properties. I did not, I sold, but I didn't like it. I was selling in Greenside and Emerentia and Parkhurst. So my mother bought a uh, house for spec and she was going to get her friend to do the house. So I took an opportunity to say, listen, I will do the house. I had a kind of an idea what to do. She says, no, not so fast, Jackson. You go to an architect first, you learn the business and then you come back to me. I'll keep the house for you untouched. Go and do what I'm telling you to do. So I found an architect, I didn't know him, he was in the observatory, Johannesburg, and uh, his name was Jack Robbins. And I went along and I said, basically, I want to watch. I'll help with the construction, I'll help with the everything, I'll be there as a laborer, but just teach me. So that was the deal. So I watched every step for six months, and the house was built. And then he was going to move into the new house, sell the old house, then I came back to its real estate role. I sat show day. I actually sold his old house on the show day. And now I came back to my mother. I said, right, I can build. I've been with him. I've even got a building team because the team that left him, I said, I'll employ you to do this house. It was a big, old, fashioned house in Houghton, mm -hmm. in 8th Avenue. And I did the plans because he taught me a bit how to do plans. And I changed an old box into a Georgian mansion. It took me eight months. And uh, the only problem was that there was an overspend. 
and my mother was very cross. <laughs> and um, we put it on show, we couldn't sell it, we couldn't sell it, and eventually uh, came along a guy called Benny Sloan. He was the then head of Tedelec South Africa, and he loved the home. But he gave 20,000 rand less than it cost. And my mother was furious. So then my first son was born more or less at the same time and instead of a congratulations at the nursing home I got a, a message from the, the scooter guy, he, um, you're fired. Wow. So now what did I do? Because of all the show days there was a Mrs Levy who liked my building operation so I already had a job as I was fired. Mrs. Levy said, come, come and do a job for me in house and I liked, I liked your uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started. Mm -hmm. So I had the team. All I had to do was buy a truck, a Toyota Stout, signboards, and I was in business. And it lasted eight years. So your father taught you a valuable lesson when you nearly drowned, that in life you have to learn how to sing or swim. I'm sure this lesson has helped you in many facets of your life. I've, uh, there's a, a picture of the tube in the book. These old-fashioned rubber tubes that they used to put on, I think, uh, scooter bikes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we went to a resort outside Johannesburg and uh, for swimming, it was a Sunday. And I had this tube on and before I knew it, I got chucked into the pool. I'd never known how to swim, but he then, I, no one realized that I actually slipped through the tube. Mm -hmm. Now, I was underwater. So I didn't, I had to, out of panic, I thrashed and thrashed and thrashed and emerged in the surface where my father grabbed me out of the water. And then, that's what he said to me, he says, in life you've got to learn how to sink or swim, and you swam. Mm. Mm. Can you please share uh, the first uh, successful business venture at school or while you're playing marbles with your friends? <laughs> well, that was at Yeovil Boys. <laughs> And uh, yes, well, they had a gravel a courtyard. No, it wasn't gravel, it was cemento. And the boys were marble bad. They used to either play one-on-ones or they used to have a pyramid of 10 marbles. But I decided to have a pyramid of 20 guns, giving it a bigger a curb appeal to the boys. But I made the, uh, I made the, uh, the border where they could throw the marbles from quite far away mm -hmm. so I was hailed it was like being hailed with bullets everybody was throwing marbles at me I was catching them all over the place and even a marble even if it hit the gun mm -hmm. the, the pyramid it was hard to, to break it up occasionally they broke it up but at the end of the day I ended up with bags and bags of marbles <laughs> So marketing was your strongest point uh, in the business. You could even sell a house uh, that used to be leased uh, to trans prostitutes. Tell us about that. Oh, that was funny. Uh, <laughs> yes, so uh, a group of attorneys, I even remember the name, Trump and Company, mm. and uh, there was a trans uh, a prostitute uh, living there, renting there. So they said, go and have a look at the house and give, give me an assessment. Mm -hmm. and. I opened the door, the, the pong that came at me was, it was uh, unbearable. It was a very dirtily kept house. And the house was in bad condition. So I phoned up the attorney and said, look, we're not going to sell this house. You're either going to fix it or I'm going to make a, a very mad advert that might attract people. Have I got carte blanche to go ahead and put in exactly what I want? Huh? Do what you want. So the advert went, uh, at 200,000 Rand, this is a fumigator's paradise. Mm -hmm. At 100,000 Rand, it's a perfume garden. All this home needs is a good wash. Agent will supply gas masks. That was the nub of the ad, and then we went on a bit further. So I was running with my friend Charlie, and we, uh, I said, you know, let's just go past it. I'm interested to see what happen what, what's happening there. And it was bumper to bumper cars. They felt sorry for this little house that was unwashed. <laughs> and at the end of the day, we got two hundred thousand rand for the house. Wow. There were so many people, and and you, once you, you know, once you told them, 
If you don't tell them, they'll come and say, well, it's stinky, it's horrible. Mm. But we've told them it's stinky, it's horrible. Mm. Come and save this poor little orphan. You tell the truth in a palatable way. Mm. So one of your employees by the name of June who wanted to resign brought a different aspect in your business which turned out to be incredible. Please share that story. Sotheby's International Realty, yes. Well, I always knew about Sotheby's, but the auction house, because mm. it was famous throughout the world, and uh, in many uh, movies there was a Sotheby's auction, and it really, to me, it looked like the uh, epitome of luxury, wealth, and class. So she, after she, she came to me one day, she says, I'm resigning. I said, why are you resigning? She said, I don't feel I'm pulling my weight amongst the others. I said, rubbish, June. You're part of the family, I'm not going to let you resign. Two weeks later, she comes to me, she brings me a magazine. She says, have you ever thought of Sotheby's? I said, I know Sotheby's the auction house. She says, no, they're in real estate. And then she showed me pictures of how they were showcasing international properties. Mm. I thought, hmm, that's quite an idea. Anyhow, I went on holiday, it was near to December, and, and this thing was going in my mind, going in my, and I came back, I said, what have I got to lose? Let me write to them and see what happens. So I wrote to them, it was a guy, Kraft in Germany, he was, he was in charge of international. And I said to him, here are my credentials, I've been in the property market for 18 years, I've got 150 agents operating the Johannesburg area, and um, I would like to be part of Sotheby's. Well, it was very easy, because what they gave me was a very um, easy marketing agreement, which meant that they could cancel me easily, there was no real protections, mm -hmm. and I had to take a chance. Do I do it, or don't I do it? Mm -hmm. I said, do it. And we changed from the red, black, and white colors to the blue, the royal blue, and I promise you, from day one, the client base changed immediately. Suddenly, we were an up, 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 up market company, and from there, it's history. You've also completed a Comrades Marathon, which all started uh, with a 10K in Bedford View. Yes, well, you know, that was a, it started with anger management, because at that stage, I was cross with my mother. Because my mother had this big company, I had a real estate, and I had one page, and she had 20 pages of properties. And one day my wife Sandy gets up early in the morning, I said, what are you doing? No, I'm going to run the Bliss Marathon in um, Bedford View. Mm. I said, what? Anyhow, she went. She left me lying in bed thinking about it. I said, well, why am I not running the Bliss Marathon? So. I went for my first 10 kilometer run after that and then, then I got hooked I've, because it gives you beta endorphins, it gives you a chemical when you run uh, uh, properly and uh, it was just a, a natural transition to, to do a marathon, a half marathon and then a marathon and then you do the whole lot and then you meet all the guys and then suddenly you're running the comrades. Mm -hmm. you, you get swept in a vortex. So I did the one comrades, I did another comrades, and I did the third one where I changed my style. I had corn syrup, something else different to my uh, usual, and I started cramping 30 kilometers out. I went to 70, I said, no, nah, enough for me. What would you say now to encourage uh, anyone who's in the business as our government is struggling in the country to resuscitate the economy? Well. You can only do the best you can, but they're very, very tough circumstances at the moment. Everything's against. If you can push through this, you're doing very, very well. I mean, we all know what the situation is with electricity, with the water, with the... Uh, I'm sorry, but change needs to happen. If we don't change, it's, it's going to collapse. We have to change. We, we, you can't do the same thing every day and expect different results. You have to now embrace. Uh, what, are you, what has to be done is you've got to get rid of the corruption, and that seems to be the hardest thing. And lastly, uh, what else will the readers miss if they don't get to read uh, this incredible copy? What do they miss? 
a lot of fun. <laughs> Because I, did, I wrote the book for myself. Mm. I never intended to publish it or make money out of it. Mm. It was something I did in COVID when I had nothing to do in lockdown. Mm. But you know, once I start something, I can't stop. So over a process of four years, I carried on. Now I'm a big reader of, uh, I'm a big reader per se, mm. but in my latter years, I love autobiographies because I find them more unreal than fiction about people and what they do and what they achieve. Mm. And I hate the autobiographies where they try and paint themselves as a saint. I'm, t I'm not a saint. Mm. And my book is not vanilla. And my book is there to entertain you and make you laugh. There was Lou Giffen speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book titled Soul Mandate, The Extraordinary Life of a Property Maverick.